would you mind passing back there with a baseball bat and hitting everybody? <laughs> <laughs> I know it is. Yeah, baseball. All right, everyone. Jesus Christ. <laughs> I got all sorts of things I brought with me. Uh, trying to figure out who I am and why I'm here. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, I, I brought along, uh, I want to start with a, with a poem of mine because a lot of people think of me as only a science fiction writer. And, of course, that's ridiculous. I'm a father of, of four daughters and uh, love them all dearly. And along the way, I've noticed my own daughters watching the boys across the street. Uh, a couple of years ago, a whole bunch of new boys moved in across the street from our house, and my four daughters started looking at them. And so I thought, oh, geez, I've uh, got to pay attention to this and see what's going on. So I've written a poem, which I'd like to start the evening with here. Uh, it's called, The Boys Across the Street Are Driving My, da my Young Daughter Mad. And if you'll permit those of you who haven't heard this before, I hope. The boys across the street are driving my young daughter mad. The boys are only 17, my daughter one year less. And all that these boys do is jump up in the sky and beautifully finesse a basketball into a hoop that take forever coming down. Their long legs brown and cleaving on the air as if it were a rare, warm summer water. The boys across the street are maddening my daughter, and all they do is ride by on their shining bikes shot with insults, trading lumps, oblivious of the way they tread their pedals, <coughs> churning time with long tan legs, and easing up thrust seat with down thrust orchard lumps. Their faces neither glad nor sad, but calm. The boys across the street toss back their hair and heedless drive my daughters mad. They jog around the block and loosen up their knees. They wrestle like a summer breeze upon a lawn. Oh, how I wish they would not wrestle, sweating on the green, all groans, until my daughter moans and goes to stand beneath a shower. <laughs> <laughs> so her own cries are all she hears, and feels but her own tears mixed with the water. Thus it has been all summer with these boys and my mad daughter. Great God, what must I do? Steal their fine bikes? Deflate their basketballs, <laughs> their, their tennis shoes, their skin-tight swimming togs, their svel gymnasium suits in deep in bogs, then wall up all our windows. To what use? The boys would still laugh wild, a wrestle on our lawn. Our shower would run all night. <laughs> How can I raise my daughter as a saint? When some small part of me grows faint, remembering a girl long years ago who by the hour jumped rope, jumped rope, jumped rope, and sent me weeping to the shop. <laughs> here tonight, don't you? All kinds of things go into my character and all kinds of remembrances. And I've tried to live with my intuitive self. I've tried to act with that intuitive self. I've tried to be passionate before I was an intellectual. I, if there's any quality that one can describe as worthwhile, I hope, about myself, it is the fact that I'm an emotional person before I'm an intellect, because they're all locked into our body at the same moment. You can't really point to one part of yourself and say that is the intellectual, that is the emotional self. They're all there at the same moment. We look at people and we fall in love. We look at ideas and we fall in love. And we try to act upon those love, loves within the instant, within the hour before it goes, before it vanishes. So I've, I've tried to write, uh, I, God knows I wrote uh, the Martian Chronicles uh, while I was courting my wife 29 years ago. I used to be downtown in Los Angeles playing miniature golf with her late at night. Before I married her, we'd be at the uh, Gittleson Brothers Golf Course 
down here around 6th Street and uh, whatever the cross street was, uh, not a few hundred yards from here. And I'd go home to Venice, California late at night and I'd write uh, Illa or The Moon Be Still as Bride or whatever it was in Venice, uh, looking out over these meadows uh, from my uh, father and mother's uh, backyard uh, when I was 27, 28, 29 years old. And I was making roughly $20 a week. So you go with that emotion, you go with that intuition, you go with that love, and you suddenly discover 25 or 28 years later that you've done something that other people like. And the same way with my own remembrance of my childhood in uh, Waukegan, Illinois, uh, with my mother and my father and my brother. And I discovered very late in time that I very dearly loved them. I remember when I got the job of writing Moby Dick back uh, 23 years ago. My dad came to the house late, thank you very much, late one afternoon, and brought with him uh, my God. <laughs> make up Thank you very much, my dear. <laughs> brought with him the, the gold watch of his grandfather in turn and gave it to me and said, you know, bon voyage, goodbye. And I thought I would be in Ireland and Europe for a year. <laughs> 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 and I looked into my father's face and, and tears were in his eyes and I said to you guys, my God, here is a man who loves me. Here's a man who loves me very much. And I was so pleased that that particular uh, couple of years ahead, I finished Dan Line Wine about all of my relatives, about my father, about my mother, about my brother and myself. And I have a poem here that I've done which explains the gestation of dandelion wine and other things in my life. The, the, these things carry over into the October country and things that you find in something wicked this way comes. But uh, this poem especially, I think, describes my own childhood and the way I became what I was as a writer later on in my life. Um, it's called Byzantium I Come Not From. Byzantium I come not from, but from another time and place, whose race is simple, tried, and true. As boy, I drop me forth in Illinois, a name whose, with neither love nor grace, was Waukegan, there I came from. And not good friends, Byzantium. And yet, in looking back, I see from topmost part of farthest tree, a land as bright, beloved, and blue as any Yates found to be true. The house I lived in, hewn of gold, and on the highest market sold, was dandelion minted made by spendthrift bees in bee-loud glade. And then, of course, our finest wine came forth from that same dandelion, while dandelion was my hair, as bright as all the summer air. I dipped in rain barrels for my eyes, and cherries stained my lips, my cries. My shouts of purest exultation Byzantium, no, that Indian nation which made of Indian girls and boys spelled forth itself as Illinois. <laughs> Yet all the Indians be, Indian bees did hum Byzantium, Byzantium. So we grew up with mythic dead to spoon upon Midwestern bread and spread old gods bright marmalade to slake in peanut butter shade pretending there beneath our sky that it was Aphrodite's thigh. <laughs> pretending, too, that Zeus was ours, and, and Thor fell down in thunder showers, while by the porch rail, calm and bold, his word, pure wisdom, staring pure gold, my grandfather, a myth indeed, did all of Plato supersede. While Grandma, my rocking chair, sewed up the raveled sleeve of care, Crocheted cool snowflakes, rare and bright, to winter us on summer night. And uncles gathered with their smokes, emitted wisdoms, masked as jokes. And aunts, and aunts as, as, wide as, as wise as Delphic maids, dispensed prophetic lemonades. To boys knelt there as acolytes to Grecian porch on summer nights, 
then went to bed there to repent the evils of the innocent. The gnat sins sizzling in their ears said through the nights and through the years, not Illinois nor Waukegan, but blither sky and blither sun, though mediocre all our fates, and mayor not as bright as Yates, yet still we knew ourselves the sum Byzantium. Byzantium. happened to me, people are always saying, how did you become a writer? Well, I became a writer out of my loves. And if you don't become a writer out of your loves, you're no writer at all. If you don't become an actor out of your loves, you're no actor. If you don't become a, a painter out of your loves, you're no painter. If you don't want to do a thing with all your heart and soul, madly, madly, hysterically, it's not worth doing. Uh, if people come up to me and say, hey, am I in love with that girl? I say, no, you're not. And they come up and say, yeah, I am in love with that girl. I say, yes, you are. <laughs> or I'm in love with that boy. Yeah, yeah okay, go get him. Huh? Uh, or I love writing. I am a writer. Yes, you are a writer. I am an actor. Yes, you are an actor. I am a painter. Yes, you are a painter. But only if you declare yourself to me can I help you. Don't ask me what you are. Tell me what you are. And if I have anything to teach you tonight, it is to declare yourselves, to declare your loves, to dare to be foolish, to, bear to, to dare to be stupid in, in the face of a universe that doesn't care what you're doing. So you must care, mustn't you? Huh? And if you care, then I can care. You come to me and tell me what you love, and then I can pat you on the head and say, okay, go get it, go get it. You know? Go, go live it out. Go be it. Go, go become the thing that you love. And if it's anything I've learned over the years, it is that simple truth. And yet it's not being taught, is it? Not in our schools and not among ourselves. And I have to teach it every chance I get to you who, who come to find out what the hell is going on in the universe. And we really don't know it, do we? So we have to make our own truth as we go. We declare ourselves and we say, I want to go to the stars, and we become an astronaut, or we become a science fiction writer, or we become a poet, or we become an actor, to explain reality to ourselves, but only through poetry, through the poetry of the visual image, or the poetry of the short story, poetry of the novel, poetry of the painting, whatever it happens to be. So, uh, I, I've learned to live with my emotions, and to live well with them, over a period of years. And if I teach anything, I teach that. Now, let's see what else I brought with me tonight to try to explain myself to each of you that is, that is here and is curious about the sort of thing. Uh, I got the job of writing Moby Dick 23 years ago from John Houston, who came to me after reading all of my books when I was 31, came back to me when I was 33, and said, how would you like to write the screenplay of Moby Dick? And I said, well, geez, I don't know. I've never been able to read the damn book. <laughs> so uh, I said, I tell you what, I'll go home tonight, and I will read Moby Dick, and I will come back at lunch tomorrow. And I will... <laughs> it's pretty, pretty impossible, right? You can't do it overnight. What I did was I read half of Moby Dick. Would you believe a third? Because uh, it's 900 pages. So I was, but what I did, instead of trying to read the whole book, I read Moby Dick as I use a library. Now I don't know how most of you use a library. Shall I tell you how I use a library? You go into a library and you run off 100 feet and you have a diving board in the middle of the library, and you run and you jump into the goddamn center of the library, right? <laughs> And you open any book that comes to your hand, and blindly, 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 here. And you pick a book over here and a book over there. You go over to the children's section, you find out what's being done there. You go over to the adult section, you go into history. Whatever it is that you fall in love with in the instant, in the instant. Not after thinking it over, no, no, in the instant. Because you know all love is that instantaneous. The people that you've loved most, it's been incredible, hasn't it? Think of all of the loves in your life that have been that 
instant instantaneous thing of looking into a woman's face or a man's face and say, you, you're it. Huh? That's it. As of tonight, bang. <laughs> I got news for you. We're going home together, right? That's <laughs> true for a book. Same way, same thing. Absolutely identical. So that you fall in love and you say, oh my God, I can't live without this person. I can't live without that book. And you take that book home and you lick the goddamn thing. <laughs> books smell good, first of all. Have you smelled any books lately? <laughs> Jesus Christ, they're beautiful. And so I've learned over the years the difference between a book published in England and a book published in France. <laughs> Have you ever had a French book in bed with you? <laughs> all right, you know what I mean. They smell differently, they taste differently, they look differently. So you fall in love, and the next day, after investigating those parts of Moby Dick that worked for me, where, for instance, I opened the uh, uh, Moby Dick at the section where Melville describes the whiteness of the whale, the whiteness of midnights, the whiteness of terrors and, and horrors and nightmares, and the white creatures that surface themselves with no eyes because they have no need for them from the subterranean depths of the sea and all the colors of terror and panic and midnight he describes and then later on he describes the great jet of the whale somehow put to sea like the fountain of Versailles and sprinkling the deeps of 3 a.m. in the morning with these great fountains of diamonds and crystals and then you move on to a section where Melville describes Ahab standing at the helm, and Ahab says, it's a mild, mild day, and a mild-looking sky, and the wind smells as if it blew from the shadow of the Andes, where the moors have lain down with their sides. And I turn back from the middle of the book to the center, and then to the beginning, and I read, Call me Ishmael. And I was in love. I was in love with the spirit of Shakespeare, which inhabits that book. I didn't find out until years later. The deep influence of, of, of Shakespeare on Melville's life. And after I had finished the screenplay, after I had worked on it for many months, I read the book nine times over a period of seven or eight months in Dublin. And then I got out of bed in England, in London, one afternoon nine months later, and I walked over to a mirror, and I looked at it, and I said, I am Herman Melville. <laughs> and that day, I rewrote the last third of the screenplay in one day. The next time, well, it was on the air two weeks ago. The next time you see it, look at the last third of that screenplay, the last third of that film. It was all done in one day. On the day I named myself for my ancestor, and my ancestor before that is Shakespeare. So it's fascinating in doing my research, after all the years have passed, of falling in love with Melville, falling in love with Shakespeare when I was 14, to discover that Shakespeare was the influencer of Melville, that Melville had never read Shakespeare at all until he was 31 years old. He came back from the South Seas, he'd been around the world on a whaling expedition, and never read Shakespeare. He went off to Boston when he was 31. He was writing a book on the whaling industry. Can you imagine that? A book on the whaling industry, on making blubber. He's going to do a novel. <laughs> Come on, cut it out. And uh, he, went, he went to Boston on a trip, and he found an edition of Shakespeare with large type. Say, now your generation has benefited from the fact that any book you buy in any bookstore has large type so that your eyes can read it. But back 100 years ago, they didn't have books like that. It was a rare book with large type that you could read. And if you were blind, you had to have people read it to you. So suddenly he goes off to Boston. He falls in love with Lear. He falls in love with Richard III. He reads Hamlet. He reads all these fabulous things, and he takes his book on whaling, and what does he do? He throws it out the window, and within nine months after the impact of Shakespeare on his life, 
He births Moby Dick. Fantastic thing. So these are my predecessors. This is my father, and this is my father. It's impossible to have two fathers, but they are. I don't have a father and a mother. I have two fathers, Shakespeare and Melville. So I've done a poem on this. So if you'll permit me to read the poem, a short version of it, which was published by Roy Squires uh, about a year ago. At first there were but whales, but now a whale. At first there was but sea and tides by night, but now the fountains of Versailles somehow set sail and sprinkled all the vasty deeps at 3 a.m. with soul pure jets. At first there was no captain to the ship, which named the quad set sail for destination, not for God. But God obtruded, rose, and blew his breath, and Ahab rose, full born, to follow death, no doubt opinions, seek in the strangest salt dominions for one beast. And from what was a simple-minded breakfast, oh, Jesus, mild and tempered sweetmeats, now a feast. How came it so? That from such crumbs tossed forth at morning, such great nightmare terrors grow. What was a cat toy, lost upon old summer lawns, has through one season grown to monstrous size, to panic color all gray Melville's dawn. Why, Willie happened to that is the end, the explanation, and the all. As blind almost as Homer, Herman never read the good or bad or in between Othello, the dead put down by Richard III, Iago's bad boast, never gone out at midnight in his mind, had Ahab, with a small a, stumbled and fallen blind against mad Hamlet's father's murdered ghost. But now, in seven volumes of large size, and large, O oh gods, the fonts of tight, the words, the trumpetings of metaphor and doom, all that was microscopic now filled his room. All that he filled his room now filled his mind. From south to west, then east, and now the panic north. Shakespeare, beneath his window, gave this show. Oh, Lazarus, Herman Melville, truly come ye forth. And what's that with you? The dreadful gossamer, funeral wake, or Arctic Vale. What, this? Oh, 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 Jesus, Lily of the Valley, breath. It, it seems to be a whale. <laughs> and what a whale! True born beast of God, Shakespeare stood back away as Herman trod a path and made a launching spot a maze. We're in to lose, then find Titanic Moby, and then send him down the ways. So Melville and his inner deeps did dive to find the shroud, the ghost, the thing alive, and all the flesh that aged shadow dead, most wanted issue to be found, known, read, and on the lawns of Avon took his stance to join the bard in festive antic dance. And to the morning window of old Will, as morn came up and dusk went down the sill, cried out, O Lazarus William Shakespeare, come you forth in whale. And Will, all fleshed in marble white, could not prevail against such summonings and taunts, and slid him forth in size for jaunts to break a continent, sink armadas in the tides. So Shakespeare glides forever in dread comet tales that shine the deeps. He prowls that mutual subterrane where Melville, God's truth, starts and wakes from murdered sleeps. And thus, from his antique call, his bloody veil, his Willie William, long gone dust in jail, was clambered forth to freedom in a whale that swam all thunders, rumors, Plunders in the dawn, insurance that good Shakespeare, now reborn, would live two lives, the one he'd made before, but now another chance to make less more. So off around the world ran two men wild, skinned in one Lazarus flesh, one loud, one mild, each summoning the other, and neither knowing which was the elder, therefore evil, wiser brother. Until flukes out black blood from mutual toil, they brought a miracle of fish to boil. Like God who spoke and uttered light, 
these twins in unison said, Night! And there was night. That night in which great panic spread and hid. That dawnless hour from which old Moby slid and knocked the world half off its axis into awe. And all because dear Willie stuck his metaphor down Herman's craw. <laughs> I've been fascinated with the impact of our technologies on our world. Um, a year ago this month, George Cukor offered me a chance to write the screenplay of The Blooper. And I had my doubts, and I went to the library, and I got a copy of The Blooper, and I took it home and I read it. And I called Mr. Cukor, and I love him dearly, and I love his films. I love all the things that he's done with Katie Hepburn. I'm madly in love with Katie Hepburn. And I called him, I said, gee, there's no way of doing this. And he said, why not? I said, well, I... He says, come on over to lunch and explain to me. So I went over to have lunch with George Cukor, because I admire him so much. Got over to his house. And since I don't drive, I, I, I hired a cab and went over to his place and somehow got in through the kitchen. I didn't go into the front door. And the, the maids took me through the house and into this large living room. And seated there at 12 o'clock noon with George Cukor was Catherine Hepburn. <laughs> well, I looked at him and I said, Ah, oh, naughty, naughty, George. <laughs> no fair, no fair because I knew he was working on me, and he turned to Hepburn, he says, Katie, read something from the Bluebird for Ray. So I thought, I mean, she could read me my own birth certificate, you know, and I'm way out in outer space somewhere. And <laughs> so I sat there, and bless her, she was so beautiful, she got halfway through a couple of pages of the Bluebird, and she said, oh my God! This is redundant. <laughs> I said, yes, it's redundant. We people are the beneficiaries of a redundant society where things have happened that we haven't even noticed. Now, let me list them for you. In this room tonight, at least half of you are here because of this fabulously redundant society that has allowed you to live. You don't even know that. Nobody has told you. But when I was born in 1920, 50% of every family in the United States died by the age of 15. That was it! That was it! We've been so busy criticizing ourselves the last few years. Oh boy, the Americans are this, the Americans are that, we're shit, we're all sorts of things. We are not. We are the saviors of the world. Starting in 1930, when I was born, 1920, I had a dead brother already. When I was six, my sister died. 50% of my family died by the time I was six. That is no longer true. In the Bluebird, they have a scene where these children go off to visit their dead brothers and sisters in the graveyard. No longer true. It doesn't happen. You don't have dead brothers and sisters. I wish you did, but you don't. Huh? You wish you did, but you don't. Huh? That's all changed starting in 1939, before most of you were born. You don't know your own history. You haven't bothered to research it. You are ignorant. You are dumb. Go look it up and you'll find out what I'm saying is true. Starting in 1939, 1940, 41, someone invented penicillin, someone invented sulfonilamide, and as a result, 50% of you here tonight are alive because of American medicine. No one's told you that. You haven't an education. 
boy, are you stupid. <laughs> that doesn't work in the Bluebird anymore. There's another section later on in the novel and then in the, uh, the stage play, uh, produced in 1905, where the children go off to visit their dead grandmothers and grandfathers uh, in the local cemetery. No longer true. They're all living in Sun City and La Jolla. <laughs> Have you noticed? Are you paying attention? You are the beneficiaries of a fantastic medical revolution. No one's telling you. I'm telling you. Get the hell out of here and think about it tonight and go find out if I'm wrong. I am not wrong. I am right. And the Americans did this. And we've been feeding the world for 40 years. No one's telling you all this. We've been California, California, for Christ's sake, has been feeding most of the American continent the last 30 years. California, this one state. And anytime we decide to plant the whole goddamn state, we feed the whole goddamn world. Has anyone told you that recently? Okay, go research it. We've got a wilderness here. It hasn't been touched with water yet. Most of it from Los Angeles on out to Death Valley. If you've been out to Death Valley, lady, you've been out there to research, it's all desert. It's all waiting for water. Waiting for water. Huh? Anytime we bring the seeds, we bring the water, we do the job. Huh? But you don't want to hear that. You want something negative from me, you're not going to get it. <laughs> Fuck you, okay? Because <laughs> all you've heard is negativity from everyone so long now, you're really sold on this. Well, screw that. That's not the way it is. We're going to make do to 2001. I'm sorry to depress you. <laughs> Anytime we want to get off our ass and do it, we will do it. If we don't get off our ass, we deserve it all. Right? Right. Okay. Because that's it. Okay. All right. So I didn't take the job of writing. <laughs> oh, the blooper. I could. I want you to know what kind of person you got before you. We have a real altruist here. I could have taken $125,000 for doing a screen job I didn't believe in. You know, from I could have gone to live in Leningrad. I have friends that were over there the last few months. And uh, are you back with us? Yes. What do you got to I'm bringing you an empty wine bottle, but I'm also bringing you Harlan Ellison to introduce Ray Bradbury. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> she smokes cigars, very strangely. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I have been asked this evening to come and introduce a man <laughs> who has been talking for apparently 45 minutes. Is that correct? Uh, we will not let that deter us in any way. We will press on. We were just roasting DP Deal. You don't know what a debacle it was up there. What a nightmare. Everybody choked one bob, banged out of his mind next to me, wilting my eyebrows, <laughs> sucking away doubles you could not believe. Larry Todd from Hunter's Books telling me how to sell coffee table books on the other side. Uh, crazy Daryl Punnison telling obscene jokes about meeting his wife in a toilet. Terrible. <laughs> Terrible. And Bradbury, out of the, the most off-the-wall human being in the universe, reads a poem about Moby Dick, for Christ's sake. <laughs> Nothing whatsoever. Everybody sat and said, what's happening? What's going on? <laughs> you know, ladies and gentlemen, I have known Ray Bradbury since we were both children together in Illinois. <laughs> when we sat on the porch those fine summer evenings and watched the spaceships go up like popcorn, pop, pop, pop. <laughs> I don't know, which rotten story should I tell them about you? I don't know. Should I tell them about you with the, with the Mexican kid? My no, with the grandmother there. I, I saw him cause a race riot. <laughs> Literally cause a riot. I don't know what, what school was that at. Uh, I don't know. We got we went we went he doesn't drive. Yeah, oh, oh, he doesn't yeah, drive. Yes, uh, that college, yes, we were together. I yes, think. right. Oh, he's he's pretty well gone too. You're gonna have to <laughs> this is this is not apple cider he's socking there. Um, and he, he he doesn't drive. So he mooches off me. He says, oh, listen, uh, we're both going out to uh, uh, East Jockstrap. Why don't you uh, 
why don't you drive me? So I, I said, okay, Ray, so I drive him. We get there together, we wind up on the same platform together, which is really a Birkin hair act. I mean, it's, you know, it's like being a cobra at a mongoose rally. <laughs> and there's 150,000 kids, most of whom are Chicanos, right? And immediately some kid stands up in the back and you can spot from the fervor in his eyes that he's laying in wait for this one, right? And he says, Meet the Reverend, I, all I do is a Puerto Rican accent, so if I get it wrong, excuse me. It comes from watching On the Rocks too much. And he says, uh, so Mr. Reverend, why do you denigrate the Mexican-American people in the wonderful ice cream soup? Ray immediately begins raging. What the hell do you know, you greaser? Shut up! <laughs> <laughs> the, the kid goes bananas! He's screaming from the aisle, what the hell up there? And the whole aisle goes, oh. Lovable himself about to be lynched for driving on tape. Hold it, hold it, folks, hold it. Up. It's like walking into the middle of a cat fight. And I'm trying to explain, well, uh, you see, Ray was trying to say, uh, and, you know, trying to explain him is very difficult. Anyhow, uh, half the goddamn audience got up and boycotted and split, and the other half sat there and went, <laughs> and all the way home, I had to listen to him tell me how the kid didn't know anything. Anyhow, ladies and gentlemen, it is my direct pleasure to introduce. <laughs> Very sweet man. <laughs> Underneath it all, God knows. Uh, Ray Bradbury. Ray, uh, why don't you give your talk now? <laughs> now that's the way to get an introduction, isn't it? In the middle of everything. And uh, screw you, Harlan. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear, well, alright. Jesus, it's late. That's it's very late. Oh, my God, Jesus. Alright, okay. <laughs> alright. I've got a, uh, I'm trying to figure out what else I got here to, to finish with. Um, I always bring lots of things along with me. And I'm trying to figure out what would be, what would be best. Uh, I beg pardon? Oh yeah, I gotta finish the story about George Cooper. Yes. And uh oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, since we don't any uh anymore in our society have dead children and dead grandparents, I don't see any way of doing screenplay of the bluebird. I I, I can't find a way of doing this. And Kitty Hepper and God bless her came to my rescue and said, you know. Ray's Bryant. And so I didn't take the job, and those people have gone off and just come back from uh, Russia, you know, a year later with a devastating report from all the things that happened to them. I don't know what the film is like. I hope it's okay. I would like to go to work for George Cukor someday, uh, in spite of this. But I couldn't because of the science fictional changes in that play, you see. And these are changes that happen to all our lives and we don't notice them. And I feel I must call attention to them in your lives. So that we go away and say, hey, that's what science fiction is about. That is what life is about. Uh, no matter what we think right now about the world situation, and we would love, wouldn't we? Let's name the people we would love to destroy, starting tonight. Huh? All the Russians, right? We just want to knock the hell out of the Russians, and all the Chinese, and they would love to kill us, right? Oh my God, wouldn't it be great if we had a war tomorrow, and they could just bomb the Jesus out of us, right? And then you got the Muslims and the Jews, and the Catholics and the Protestants in the north of Ireland. You have just pure Russia against the United States. You've got old against young. You've got men against women. Hmm? You've got, uh, you can name the polarizations all over the world which I resent with all my heart. The Iranians and, what if you were Kissinger tomorrow and had to go over to Cyprus and to Greece and to Rome and to Israel and to Egypt and make do with each of these polarizations? Fantastic, no one ever announces it that way. And I say, my God, how will I do it? You don't know and I don't know. It's too big a job, the polarizations are too big, the, the paradoxes are too big. So finally, what we have to say is the atom bomb, the hydrogen bomb, speaks to us in a very special voice in this incredible science fiction time.
time of ours. And what <coughs> does the hydrogen bomb say? Everybody sit down. <laughs> we don't want that. God, we don't want to sit down. We want to destroy each other. We are not Christians and Jews. We are not Muslims and not true Muslims. We are not true Buddhists. We are not true anything. God, we would love to kill one another. But it is not permitted. It is not permitted. There will never, never be another major war in the history of the world. Gee, I'm sorry about that, kids. I, I know, you're so frustrated. You want me to announce something horrible. And I bet the really horrible news in is there will be peace. Huh? Incredible as it seems. Right at this very point, Kissinger pointed out today. For the first time in 300 years, this day, there is no war going on in the world between any major nation. This afternoon, this evening, incredible, incredible. So, we are the paradox. We're the good and the evil. We are the male-female principle. We're the light and the dark. We're so many things that we must forget one, each, one another for. So, uh, if you'll permit me, I will end with a poem of mine about space travel. Because people are always asking me why I write about space as much as I do. And uh, so one of the last poems I have in my book of poetry uh, is a poem called If Only We Had Taller Been. And this is based upon my experience in, uh, in London six years ago. I was there for the first landing of our astronauts on the moon in, in July of 1969. And I went over to the David Frost show. Well, many of you have heard this story too many times now, and please forgive me, but for those of you who haven't heard it, I got over there around 8 o'clock at night. We landed on the moon around 8.30. And uh, I was supposed to go on and explain space travel to everybody. And I wanted to because it was my night. It was your night. It was all of our nights together. And they didn't put me out. And around 9 o'clock, after we'd been on the moon for half an hour, they put on that great space expert, Engelbert Humberdinck. <laughs> <laughs> and around 9.15, they put on that great Talmudic scholar, Sammy Davis Jr. <laughs> well, I mean, really, God, I dearly love Sammy Davis Jr. He's one of the greatest towns of our time. A dear, sweet, lovely man, but he is not a space expert. And by God, I have been training for this job since I was eight. And I want finally someone to say, Ray, tell us about it. And no one asked. So I got the hell out. I got in the, the parking lot, and the producer came running out. He said, what are you doing out here? I said, I don't know, but I'm going to leave. He says, oh, you can't leave. I said, oh, no, please let me leave. He said, no, you can't leave. I said, oh, no, please, I'm going to strike you. Let me leave. <laughs> I said, take your head off my elbow. You are unclean. Because <laughs> I, I don't like you. I don't like the program. I hate Dave Frost. <laughs> and uh, you're the sort of people that would show up at the birth of Christ and do a tap dance. <laughs> so he knew he had Ahab <laughs> with his harpoon on hand. And he let him go. And the next morning, God bless, it was so beautiful. Forgive my ego, but it did happen. I can show you the headline. In a small London newspaper, toward the bottom of the page, it said, Armstrong walks at 2 a.m., Bradbury walks at midnight. <laughs> so I got the hell out of there, and I went across London, and I went to CBS, and I was on a... TV show around the world on Telstar on the night we landed on the moon with the uh, Lord Richie Calder from uh, Santa Barbara, the great scientist, and a wonderful uh, a priest and uh, uh, minister from the Bishop of Geneva from Switzerland, and myself. And here's Bernadette Devlin from the north of Ireland, suddenly, there on the show. And ah, oh, Christ, wouldn't you know, she's, she's lamenting and crying and, and, and whimpering and making sad noises over the fact 
that all of that money has gone onto the moon and not into Northern Ireland. <laughs> so I listened to all this for about 10 minutes. And I said, all right, everyone, shut up! Shut up, sit down, sit down, sit down. For God's sake, I can't stand it. I've been waiting all my life for this night. And you people are blubbering here and screaming and yelling. I've heard all this shit for so long, I can't stand it. Shut up. I'll tell you what space travel is all about. <laughs> and I, God damn it, who, who else, huh? Maybe four other people can tell you the way I see it, the way I see it. I've got to see it because I care. Because I care. And you know I care. So I said, okay, what's it all about? You, uh, Miss uh, Dublin here, you smart ass. <laughs> I said, what do you call yourself? She says, a hooligan liberal. I says, a hooligan liberal, is it? Shall I tell you what you are in the face of the greatest night in the history of the world? You're a half-ass, half-ass, conservative, reactionary. <laughs> She'd never been called that before. <laughs> she wanted to shop, you know. They had to bring in adrenaline for her. <laughs> I put her wig back on. Her left eye popped out, they had to put that back in. They had to tuck her tongue back in her mouth because she'd never heard that before. And I said, no, what is it you're talking about? All that money being spent on the moon, we have never spent a dollar, five dollars, ten dollars, a hundred dollars, a thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars, a million dollars, a billion dollars on the moon. It's all been spent right here! Right here to build houses, to feed mouths, to educate people. What the hell are you talking about? It's never been spent on the moon. It's never been spent on the moon. <laughs> If you want me to go mad, I'll go mad here. I can't stand that. That's pure shit. <laughs> All right. Why have we spent it? Why have we spent it? How long? What is the history of philosophy? What is the history of science in the world? Shall I tell you? The history of science and religion is ignorance and the mystery trying to figure out who we are in relation to the universe we live in. We don't know. God, we don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody knows. The religionists don't know. The scientists don't know. We know nothing of ourselves in positioning ourselves to the vast mystery of the universe. So for God's sake, isn't it time we went to see to touch, to feel, to know, to understand, to explain ourselves to ourselves. For God's sake, what else have we done that we can be proud of in the last 10,000 years? The history of our wars is execrable, is horrible, is terrible. But the history of man in space can be beautiful. Now, the history of religion, history of science, is trying to find out where we came from, what we're doing here. What is the mystery of God? What is our future? We want to be immortal. We want to be immortal. All of our religions, Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, you name it, have to do with the life hereafter, which we have to create out of metaphors and myths to make ourselves explainable in the face of total mystery. Now suddenly, your generation your generation, no other generation, is privileged to have been alive in the year, in the day, in the night, in the hour, in the minute, when we touch the moon. And our chances of being immortal, which is at the heart of all our religions, is there. Because if we make landfall on the moon, if we make landfall on Mars, if we make it out to Alpha Centauri, we'll live forever. And all of your beautiful, ugly, lovely, strange faces <laughs> will be alive one billion years tonight because of space travel. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. How long have we been on the moon? 
An hour? An hour and a half? Two hours? Okay. How long did it take us to get there? Five billion years for the earth to come out of the sun, for the earth to cool, for the first rains to fall, for the oceans to form, for animalcules to stir in the surf, for the creatures to crawl out on the land, for these street things to, to build spines, to look at the sky, to watch the stars, to hide in the caves, to fall from the trees, to cross the fields, to build the walls, to make the cities, to envy the birds, to look at the stars, and very late in time, this night, reach up and touch the moon, which will make us all live forever. And you refuse to celebrate? To hell with you. <laughs> to hell with you.